Good morning. It's so good to be worshiping the Lord together, even though uh, we may be separated by different houses. It's good to be able to be united in worshiping the Lord together. Today is going to be a great day as we transition in our theme of our sermon series. We talked about the disconnected life um, a few months ago some examples from scripture that show us what not to do. Then we took seven weeks to look at Connect 7 and ways that we can be connected to God. And now we're going to just transition that a little bit and look at some positive examples from scripture of the connected life. And so we look forward to hearing from Brian today as we do that. But before we do, we want to invite you to be connected. The links below, again, will offer opportunities for you to have interactive uh, sessions with your kids and some videos that they'll be going through. And so we want to encourage you to continue to do that as a family. We want to uh, have communion together in our service today so that you can be connected uh, to the Lord and remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, celebrating through his body and his blood. Uh, but for right now, let's connect to the Father and just give him the praise that he deserves today as we worship together in song. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Come, all you here, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Above all things so wondrously reigning Shelters thee under his wings Oh, so gently sustaining Have you not seen All that is needful has been Sent from his gracious ordaining Oh Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Praise to the Lord who will prosper and defend you. Surely his goodness and mercy shall daily attend you. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. If with his love he befriends that have life and breath come now with praises before him let the amen sound from his people again gladly forever adore Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, 
his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone Oh praise the name of the Lord our God Oh praise His name for
know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still God, we come giving you praise today. Lord, you are strong, you are mighty, you are faithful in your love to us. God, we thank you for that that was shown to us, that love upon the cross where Jesus took on the punishment that we deserved. Lord, our fate upon himself. God, we uh, come praising you for that. We come praising you for the power that was displayed in the empty tomb. And God, we come thanking you that you did that just because of your love for us. Lord, you are faithful. Lord, we depend upon you. We thank you. Lord, we ask that now you would just speak to us. Lord, through your word, through your servant, Brian. Lord, may our hearts and our minds be open to your leading. Lord, draw us nearer to you. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Fences have many functions. Some people build fences to keep things out. Uh, Children, dogs, snoopy neighbors. Others build fences to keep things in, such as uh, children, dogs, definitely not snoopy neighbors, but uh, whatever you want to keep in. Uh, Some build fences to beautify their yard. A split rail fence may add just the perfect touch to your yard. Um, But people also build fences around and in their lives. Uh, These fences are built to protect themselves. Uh, To keep intruders out, sometimes these fences are even erected to keep God out, believe it or not. Uh, The fences supposedly become a barrier of protection. Uh, Jesus was and is in the business of uh, tearing down barriers. Uh, The New Testament is filled with uh, Jesus, time after time, breaking down barriers in people's lives. One episode, and that's the one I would like us to look at today, is found in John chapter 4, verse 5 through 26. Uh, As far as the background, Jesus comes to Jacob's well in Samaria. Uh, He meets a Samaritan woman, and he proceeds to break down some significant barriers that only he can break down in this woman's life. And perhaps he stands before your life today ready to break down these same walls that uh, this woman had. Uh, This woman at the well shows us how the connected life, what it looks like, how it looks. Uh, If you've been a part with us through this whole series, we started out looking at the unconnected life and looked at several individuals. And then we did the Connect 7, seven areas that we as believers are connected to. And then we want to finish up with four sermons, plus Mother's Day will be in there, where we want to look at the connected life and look at individuals from Scripture. And so today, the woman at the well, John chapter 4, uh, verse 5 through 26. Well, first of all, the uh, connected life has Jesus, uh, Jesus breaking down barriers between people. Uh, let's pick up at verse 5 and read through verse 9. And so he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That would be noon. Uh, There came a a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman uh, therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I'm a Samaritan woman? And then John puts in there for the reader this uh, parenthesis. For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Uh, We see here Jesus reaching out to break down a barrier of hatred that had existed for centuries between the Jews and the Samaritans. It was a bitter racial hatred with a lengthy tradition. In fact, the uh, average Jewish person would not travel through Samaria. 
And so what they would do if you're going from Galilee and you want to go to Jerusalem and Judea, you would not go south. You would head east, cross the Jordan River, come down through Perea, cross the Jordan River again at Jericho, and then head up to Jerusalem, bypassing uh, the land of Samaria. And the uh, extra distance uh, the Jewish person thought was no trouble especially in light of uh, the alternative, that being contamination by these unclean Samaritans. Yet Jesus had little regard for this artificial racial barrier. Furthermore, Jesus has little regard for the barrier that's erected between man and woman, male and female. In the first century, no Jewish male would speak to any woman in public, not even his wife or his uh, daughter. In fact, I sometimes wonder if some guys still are practicing that, uh, won't interact with their wife. In fact, the uh, Pharisees even went to the extreme of closing their eyes whenever they would see a woman coming towards them on a city street. And the average Jewish male thanked God daily that he was not born a Gentile, a donkey, or a woman, oftentimes in that order. So it's easy to see in the first century there's a huge barrier between men and women. So here sits Jesus by the well, and he begins a conversation with this woman. And in a few words he ignores, he breaks down the barriers between Jew and Samaritan, male and female. He brings them right down. You know, it's easy to inherit uh, this kind of hatred. Sometimes it comes from parents, friends, culture, tradition. Uh, probably many of the Jewish children had no idea why they were supposed to hate Samaritans. They just knew that they were supposed to. And what about today? Many children today can spout vicious racial slurs because where did they hear them? They heard them in the home. Prejudice, folks, is a learned behavior. Well, when Jesus becomes real in our lives, artificial barriers uh, begin to fall. Uh, prejudices and bigotry cannot coexist with Jesus' love. Where Jesus' love is, you don't find those things. In fact, what I think is interesting, look at Jesus' disciples. Where are they at this time? Uh, verse 8, uh, we are told they went into town to buy food. That would be a Samaritan town. That would be a Samaritan city. I would imagine before Jesus uh, called them, none of them would have walked through Samaria. Every one of them would have taken the long route around, uh, let alone eat Samaritan food. And yes, the uh, barriers are already falling down in the lives of the disciples. Well, Jesus breaks down barriers between people. We need to allow him to do this in our own lives. As Jesus breaks down walls, we are free to love and to serve all others. We have that freedom to do that. We become brothers and sisters that are part of one big family. A guy by the name of Edgerton Young was the first missionary to the Red Indians in the province of Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, when this missionary told his message to the Indians, uh, an old chief said to him, when you spoke of the great spirit just now, did I hear you say our father? Yes, said Mr. Young, and the chief said, that's very sweet and new to me. We never thought of the great spirit as father. Oh, we hear him in the thunder, we see him in the lightning, the tempest, and the blizzard, and we are afraid of the great spirit. So when you tell us that the great spirit is our father, that's very beautiful to us. The old missionary uh, went on and uh, shared some more. And so the chief said, uh, missionary, did you say that the great spirit is your father? Yes, I did, said Young. Then uh, did you say that he's also the Indian's father? Yes. And then the chief said, that makes you and I brothers. Uh, last week, uh, Jared talked about some of the metaphors in the church, and one of those was flock. And so here we see that we are all one flock. As Jesus breaks down barriers between people, uh, the old song, the old chorus seems to come into play. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. You see, when we're connected to Jesus, we are connected to one another. 
that's the connected life. Well, let's move on. Uh, Second, the connected life has Jesus breaking down barriers within people. Uh, With verses 9 through 18, we see a woman who is hurting. I already read verse 9, but I want to go back to that and start this uh, through verse 18. Uh, The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Uh, where then will you get this living water? Uh, You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Uh, This woman is hurting. The very fact that she came to the well at midday when most women would come early in the morning or early evening indicates isolation, a desire to avoid uh, avoid encountering people. Uh, She's already practicing social distancing. She doesn't want to be around anybody. In fact, she would be a social outcast. None of the responsible citizens would dare associate with her. She's married a series of uh, husbands, and now she's living with a man whom she's not married to. And so society has labeled her as unclean, an adulteress, an outcast. But no matter what the label is, she's hurting. There's a large barrier between hurt and healed. Well, at any rate, she stands there in the presence of Jesus. She sees her inadequacy of her own life. She senses her own need. But as I think about this woman, she's not the only one in the pages of Scripture. Uh, The prophet Isaiah, when he came into the presence of God, he cries out, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And then the apostle Peter, when he came into the presence of Jesus, as recorded in Luke 5, just simply says, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. So this woman senses her need. Furthermore, this is the starting point to recovery. To come to Jesus, first we must sense a need. That's why most evangelistic tools, models, uh, whatever you want to call those things, start with the fact that man is a sinner. People respond out of need. I buy something uh, because I feel I have a need for it. And so the same thing, if someone's going to come to Jesus, they must sense and feel their need. This woman, by being in the light and the love of Jesus, senses her need. And so the barrier between hurt and healing is coming down. And this is how Jesus breaks down barriers in our lives. At times in our walk, sin comes in, creates a barrier that keeps us from recovery. Oh, we know something is wrong. We know that we're not right. We may have kept it from other people, even those closest to us. But in our heart, we know that something is wrong. I think we feel like doing what uh, the 20 prominent men in London did when they received a note from play writer Noel Coward. I don't know if this was intended to be an April Fool's joke. It was intended to be a joke. But he simply sent a a note to all 20 of these prominent men. All is discovered. Escape while you can. All 20 of them left town. How is it uh, that we need to be like this woman and stand in the presence of Jesus? Only Jesus is able to tear down barriers within us You see, others 
we're busy judging this lady. Jesus is busy expressing his love and his concern for her. You know, Jesus breaks down barriers within us if we're willing to come to him. And although it may sound simplistic, maybe even too simplistic, I think it's true that whatever your question is, Jesus is the answer. And there are some here today, some that are hearing this sermon. Uh, you need to give things over to the Lord. You have hung on to things far too long. You've allowed that barrier to stay strong. Jesus tears down those barriers within us. And so the connected life, what does that look like? The barriers in our very lives are coming down. Well, one last thing that I would like to note is that the connected life has Jesus breaking down barriers between us and God. With verses 19 through 26, we see that the woman at the well shifts the subject to theology after Jesus exposes her life with this question. Uh, let me read the text. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then here's the uh, shift. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, uh, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. And then John puts another uh, parentheses in there to give us some information. He who is called Christ. And so she is saying, when the Messiah is coming, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. She couldn't take the examination of her life any longer, so she changed the subject. She wants to steer the conversation away from her uh, unpleasant uh, life of sin. So she introduces a distraction. I don't know about you, but I know I've done that. Uh, it's not easy for people to know us inside and out, good and bad. It's uh, easier to introduce a distraction. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, hey, have you read, uh, and then, you know, go off on something that I've read and steer the conversation away. And we've done that. But by doing this, she reveals a barrier that's been erected between herself and God. So she asks, where is the proper place to worship? The Samaritans say Mount Gerizim, while the Jews say Jerusalem. Each tried to enclose God in their religious system. And the sad thing is, churches can do that. Sometimes we act as if we have God under our control. And if people don't do it our way, then there's something wrong with them. We have uh, God under control. So religion can erect a barrier between us and God. Yet Jesus told her that worship is not validated by a traditional place, but rather by a transcendent power. Worship takes place when our spirits meet the divine spirit, not when we go to a certain place, or not even when we perform certain rituals or certain actions. Uh, please don't get me wrong. I'm not against coming to this building, and I look forward to the day when we can do that again. Uh, but if we've learned anything over seven Sundays is that worship goes on, not just on Sunday morning, but every day. And so I'm not against coming here, uh, but that's not the sum total of worship. We must never allow place or ritual to be the sum total of what you and I call worship. William Barclay states, True worship is when the spirit, the immortal, the invisible part of man, speaks to and meets with God, who is immortal, invisible. That is true worship. I think it's like any uh, relationship. Uh, the key is not ritual, the key is not place, but heart-to-heart -heart communication. 
Um, I can still remember when Cindy and I were first dating. And I don't know why, but I uh, thought that I needed to take her to special places. I spent a lot of my dad's money on uh, going to places. That's a story of its own. However, she told me that she really didn't care where we went, if we even went anywhere. She just wanted to be with me. She wanted to get to know me. Folks, true worshipers are not concerned about place or ritual, rather just meeting God, getting to know him. So I ask you in this message, how is your worship? Is there a barrier between you and God? Have you based your relationship with God on outward circumstances, as this woman did? And so are you into religion or are you into Jesus? Jesus can remove this barrier if we just follow his word. He has told us how to have a right relationship. And like this woman, we can remove the barrier between God and ourselves. And so the connected life has the fence down between us and God. Well, those are the barriers that Jesus uh, brought down. He broke down the barrier uh, between people that this woman had. He broke down the barrier within this woman's life. And he broke down the barrier between God and this woman. Yes, this woman came to the well. She met Jesus and she had all of these fences. But when she left, all the fences were down. What is the barrier in your life today? Is it that fence between you and other people? Is it a wall between uh, yourself, uh, within yourself, um, trying to uh, move ahead and you have this wall? Or is there a wall, a fence between you and God? The good news is that Jesus is in the business of tearing down fences, breaking barriers, and connecting people in your life and in my life. Will you allow him to have his way in your life? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that uh, John felt it necessary to include this story in his gospel. And Father, I think of uh, how uh, the gospel of John moves. That, Father, you have uh, a Pharisee in chapter 3 coming to Jesus. Uh, somebody who is uh, high class in society. And then we move into chapter 4 and we uh, come across this woman who would be labeled as low class, an outcast. And yet, Father, uh, we see that the text tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He knew of this encounter, and so, Father, I thank you for what is recorded for us. Father, I thank you for the truth that uh, fences and walls and barriers come down when we are connected to you. That, Father, we do not have to be separated from one another. That, Father, within our very lives, the wall can come down. And, Father, in our relationship with you, fences can be torn down and removed. Father, I thank you for showing us the connected life. Help us to live that out as we go from here. Father, we love you. We praise you. It's in your son's name that I pray. Amen. When we encounter Jesus, our lives are changed. That's what we just saw in John 4 with the woman at the well. Uh, she encountered the living Christ, and she would never be the same. She went from a life of sin and despair and brokenness uh, to a life of complete belief and trust in her Messiah. In fact, she started telling anyone that would listen that she had found him who was the Messiah. And the whole village ended up believing because of her. I think communion for us is similar but it's a little bit different. You see, we're on this side of the cross, and so our encounters with Jesus, our communion with Jesus, uh, we remember his death, his broken body, and his shed blood that provides the path for salvation. Uh, we remember 
that gruesome story of Friday. But we also remember Sunday. We remember his resurrection. And we celebrate his victory over death, his defeat of sin, and the hope of new life that we have. But there's one more step that we have to take. I like John 4, verse 34, when Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. See, if we're going to be like the woman at the well, and we're going to have a changed life because of an encounter with Jesus, we have to remember the mission that he was on. So I hope that that's our prayer today, that as we encounter, as we turn away from our life of sin, of our despair, and we turn to a life of hope and a life on mission with Jesus, that we will seek to do his will and fulfill his purpose. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful uh, that we get together, uh, even distant, uh, to celebrate you, to celebrate Jesus and uh, what he did on the cross for us. Uh, But more than that, Father, we get to celebrate the resurrection and we get hope uh, from that. And Father, I pray that right now as we encounter uh, the living and resurrected Christ, uh, that we would be healed of our sin, healed of our despair and brokenness, and that we would be transformed into new people, people on mission with you, seeking to do your will in our world. Uh, We love you so much, Father. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. as we wrap up this morning, I want to just ask you to spend just a few moments in prayer with me. And uh, as we begin to think about some of the people that come to your mind, maybe that uh, just need the hand of the Lord to be evident, then uh, why don't we pray right now for someone that you know that has been going through a sickness or uh, maybe some physical difficulty and uh, lift them up right now as we go to the Father together. As we uh, continue to pray together, I'd like to just ask that you think of someone maybe that has gone through loss recently, maybe somebody that might be grieving, and uh, ask God to give them his perfect peace right now. As we continue this time of prayer together, I ask that you uh, just think of maybe uh, one of our missionaries for the church all around the world, maybe going through similar things as we are here in the United States, um, and ask God to give them strength and to bless their ministry. And then as we pray every week for another church in our area, I'm going to ask you something just a little bit differently uh, today. And I'd like you to think of maybe the home church where you grew up. Maybe that's this church right here. Maybe it's another church uh, in another state or in another town. And uh, be, be thinking about them today. We have a lot of leaders who are having to make some difficult decisions. And it seems everybody's an expert. And so they're trying to seek God and, and uh, direction and wisdom. Would you lift up the leaders of the home church where you grew up uh, right now? God, 
God, we thank you so much for being a God of compassion and comfort. Lord, that you hear our prayers. Lord, the ones that we speak audibly and the ones that we, um, Lord, just meditate on asking for your help. Lord, the ones that we even have a hard time uttering. Uh, God, you know our hearts. And we ask that right now you would just help us to put our trust in you, Lord, that we would uh, take a deep breath and rest easy in your peace and your presence. God, that we would be able to uh, just acknowledge your sovereignty and know that you are in control. Lord, that we'd be able to trust in your faithful love for us. God, uh, there are so many things that are beyond our control and while that bothers us so often, Lord, we want to uh, be reminded that you are in complete control. God, that as theme, as things seem chaotic in our world, Lord, that you are the master of all these things. And we look forward to the day when, um, Lord, you'll take control of your creation. Lord, that you will uh, allow us to be in your presence fully and completely for eternity. God, until that time, we ask that we might honor you in our attitudes, Lord, in our words. Lord, that we might be a church that is united. Lord, um, not getting caught up in, in the things of this world, but being focused upon you, building each other up. God, we thank you for making the moves to connect to us. And we pray that we might be able to be wise in our lives so that the barriers that we've put up might come down as we give you uh, full access to our lives to do that. God, we thank you so much again for breaking down those barriers between us and you through Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, once again, don't forget to check the children's links below and uh, have some special time with your kids. We look forward to being together online again next week for Mother's Day. And I uh, hope that you'll join us for that. And uh, make sure you encourage your mom this week. And uh, I know she, she, she deserves it. So have a great week. Thank you again for being with us.